All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm Neil Chase. I'm the CEO here at CalMatters. Um, joined today by Stella Yu, who is our politics reporter. Um, she is based in, in Sacramento, covering the whole of California. And we're here to spend a little time talking about the upcoming election and elections in general, and especially how people understand the process of voting. We, we hear and we talk a lot about voting being you know, a, a right for a lot of people and an important part of our democracy, but it's not always easy. It can be confusing. And sometimes the folks in charge of making it accessible don't always do a great job. So we're trying to do the best job we can of explaining how it works. Uh, I want to thank our friends at the California State Library who make this possible. They are, they're supporting this work so that it can be available to libraries to share with their patrons, to classrooms around the state, to other folks who want to get this information out. And this is one in a series of, of these kinds of events we're doing along with curriculum packages. So if you go to calmatters.org slash for learning, you'll see a curriculum package about this with worksheets and some stuff in, in uh, Spanish and English, uh, things you can use in an event or to hand out to people uh, or in a classroom. So very much appreciate the partnership with the library to, to make this happen. Um, Stella, I'm going to start with a little bit of background on you, just to introduce people to, to your background. Uh, it's actually interesting because you've covered politics in a couple of different states now, and they're all different. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, just give us your short bio first, if you would. Sure. Yeah. So I'm uh, I'm really brand new to California. Uh, um, I joined CalMatters in uh, October, and I mainly cover, um, you know, campaigns and elections. Um, and so obviously for this election cycle, I'll be focused on races up and down the ballot, you know, from the, you know, the Senate, uh, Congress, um, as well as some of the state um, state races as well. Um, so before this, I was most recently in Michigan. And uh, it was really interesting as it relates to today's event, because in Michigan in 2022, voters passed a series of um, voters passed a ballot measure um, that uh, included a series of election reforms. Uh, many of those rules resemble what California already has. Um, and so I was there for about two years. But before that, I was covering local and state politics in the South. So I was um, the state politics reporter for the Nashville Tennessean for about a year. Before that, I was covering local politics in uh, Mississippi, in the Golden Triangle area. So, you know, where Mississippi State University was based at. Um, I'm a Mizzou grad. I graduated from the University of Missouri with a degree in, in investigative journalism in 2019. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, and I'm from China. So it's also interesting because we're talking about election today, but I cannot vote because I'm not a citizen. <laughs> so. Exactly. And what's fascinating, uh, that, that certainly brings a good perspective for you. Uh, and a nice segue into, into our first conversation here. But you, you, because you've covered this stuff in different places, right? The, the ways elections are handled in places like Mississippi, Tennessee, Michigan, and California. And there's there's no... They're not you know, universal statewide. Obviously, there's lots of local officials doing all kinds of good and bad things across the country in different regions. Uh, but you've had a chance to see a number of different places, which gives you some good context on on it. We always assume California is, oh, you know, we're we're a more liberal place. We're make it easier for people to vote, and that's sometimes true, but not necessarily always. Uh, you mentioned that you can't vote here because you're not yet a U.S. citizen. Um, talk about who can vote, who who can register to vote, and what are the what are the parameters on on who can register and when? Yeah, um, so obviously, you know, uh, some of the things, you know, U.S. citizens, for example, to, in order to register to vote, you need to be a U.S. citizen. You need to be, um, in order to vote in California, you need to be a California resident. Um, you need to be 18 years or older uh, on election day or before election day. Um, and also you cannot be serving a prison term for um, felony. Um, also, you, you need, to not be de uh, not be deemed mentally incompetent to vote by a court. Um, it's uh, it's also interesting and important to to note that if you're you know 16 or 17 years old, you can and, and if you meet all of the uh, above voting requirements, you can pre-register. And what that means is 
Um, once you turn 18, you're automatically registered to vote and you don't have to do it again, um, which is nice. And also since California has such a large you know, immigrant population, um, new citizens can also um, you know, start registering to vote, right? Uh, and and, and you know, we we're probably going to touch upon this later, but uh, for the March primary, for example, there is an online registration deadline um, of, of February 20th. And so if you're like a new citizen or a new state resident, even if you miss that deadline, you can still register to vote. Um, for new citizens, you just have to bring your you know, new proof of citizenship with you, along with some of the other documents that are required for everybody in order to register. And for new state residents, you know, welcome to California. And uh, you, know, uh, you can visit the county elections offices uh, at least seven days before election day if you want to register to vote in the- to register in register. person. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's fascinating when you're at naturalization uh, ceremonies, right? When, when people are becoming US citizens, when they walk out the door of the, especially the larger ones, ones they do in theaters and things like that, in large venues, when you come out, there are people lined up, and one of the first things people try to do is get you to vote, get you to register to vote, right? So there mm -hmm. are, you know, voter registration drives going on. You're you're carrying your papers in your hand. You just got them, and uh, <laughs> it's a lot of folks. Yeah, you know, they want to register as soon as they become citizens, right? The mm -hmm. sometimes we hear that people who are longtime U.S. citizens take take for granted the right to vote, where some people who come from places where the right to vote is is harder won, uh, you know, cherish it even more. Um, you mentioned registering early, right? Anybody who's 16 or 17 can can register ahead of time for the first election in, in which they're 18 to vote. Um, let's talk about dates. So the California primary is on March 5th. Mm -hmm. And run, run the deadline by us again. If, if you want to register online, you have to do it by... Sure, yeah. So the deadline for online registration is February 20th. Um, and so... You know, related to that, I mean, uh, you know, if you're not paying attention to uh, the March 5th primary, I guess very few of us actually do, uh, unfortunately, until, you know, maybe a few weeks before. So the Secretary of State's office will mail out um, its voter information guide. Um, we will also have our own CalMatters voter guide, but the Secretary of State's uh, office has its own version. They're going to mail it out January 25th, and they're going to run it through February 13th. And um, your local county election offices will also have, um, you know, a local guide, and that is going to be mailed out through February 24th. Um, and so, yeah, so, uh, you know, on, on February 5th, that's when county officials will start mailing out um, vote by mail ballots to you. Um, and for military and overseas voters, that's actually going to be even earlier. Um, the ballots are sent out between, you know, uh, 45 to 60 days before election day. But for, for you know, regular in-state residents, that's February 5th. And starting as early as February 6th, that's when the ballot drop-off locations are open. And that's like the earliest you can, you can drop off your, you know, if you, you can, you can vote by mail, so to speak. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, and of course that's been controversial in a lot of places, right? U using vote by mail, it, it uh, during the pandemic it seemed like a a no brainer, and it, it became quickly universal, at least in California. Mm -hmm. And it is you know, it's relatively easy, right? The ballot comes to your home if you're somebody who gets mail at a regular address, and you can do what most people do, which is leave it sitting there for many weeks before you even get around to opening it, uh, and maybe open it and vote, you know, toward the, toward the deadline as as the election gets closer. But the primary doesn't draw as many voters as the general election, right? Where in the primary election, you're picking which candidates are going to be on the fall ballot, on the November ballot. But there are a lot of decisions that happen on that March primary, right? So, you know, yeah. for instance, you're in Sacramento, right? If uh, if one of the candidates for Sacramento mayor gets more than 50% of the vote on March 5th, they are the new mayor. If not, then the top two candidates go to a runoff in, in November. So one of the things that I know you and our team are trying to do with this voter guide is, is help people understand what's on the ballot, what's important, what mm -hmm. decisions need to be made, and you know, try to give people the information that they need to, to vote. The, the ballot is, I think to everybody, somewhat intimidating, right? It can be long, uh, it can be confusing, and certainly as, as journalists, we try to help. Um, but what the one of the things that we often, I think people get surprised by is the fact that you don't have to vote for everything on the ballot. If you care about one office, you can open it up and vote as much as you want, right? And pick whichever ones you want and just drop it in the mail or or drop it off. Um, talk, about, if you will, a little bit about the, the primary itself. Who gets to vote and how, because the, the the primary is partially run by the state and partially run by the political parties, right? And so the 
it's a little more confusing than than the November election. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So uh, one thing that's really interesting about California, you know, as an out of stater myself, is its jungle primary, right? Uh, the system, this very unique system uh, that was adapted, I think, you know, maybe tw like 12 years ago um, now. Um, so what it means is basically, you know, uh, it, it applies to most races. Uh, it doesn't apply to all races. Um, and, and, you know, it, it doesn't apply to the U.S. presidential race, for example. Uh, and, and what the top two primary means is that, um, let's say you're running in Senate, you're running for Senate, or if you're running for Congress, then um, regardless of your party affiliations, you're on the ballot, uh, on, you know, on the March primary ballot, and voters, you know, whoever gets the most uh well, sorry, uh, whoever gets the most votes, right, those those two candidates, the top two candidates who receive the most votes in the primary, they're the ones who advance to a general. Um, and so, but, but you know, uh, you know, in California, there is a surge in uh, the number of voters who don't, who aren't really affiliated with any um, major political parties, for example, and, and those are NPP voters or no party preference voters. Um, and uh, in the presidential primary, it becomes really interesting because if you are an NPP voter and you want to vote in the Republican presidential primary, in California, you cannot do that because the Republicans have decided to hold a closed presidential primary, which means that only Republicans can vote, only registered Republicans can vote vote in that presidential primary. However, um, you can vote in a Democratic presidential primary as an MPP voter um, because, you know, the Democrats allow that. But what you need to do is to request for a uh, for a, a specific ballot. You, you have to tell your county elected officials, hey, um, I want to be able to vote in this presidential primary. Can you give me a ballot, including that race on the ballot so that I can vote in there? So. Yeah, which just gives, it's about as confusing as it can possibly be, right? But it, <laughs> it highlights the fact that it really is the job of the political parties to decide who's going to be on the ballot and the job of the state to run the election that, that mm -hmm. decides which one of the wins. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, in California, there are people registered as Democrats, people registered as, as Republicans, a huge number of people who register with no party preference, and then a number of other parties that people can can register under. Including with some, you know, some in, uh, names that are a little bit confusing, right? Like the American Independent Party, which is which is a party, as opposed to if you want to be an independent voter, exactly. Party, then you register with no party preference. So yeah. it's not always easy. But the the big difference being that anybody can vote in a Democratic primary, but the Republicans only allow registered Republicans to vote in that primary. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can and you can change you can change that every time you register, right? If you want to register for every election separately. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about what's on this ballot, right? So uh, this there's a bunch of national attention. You know, the Iowa caucuses are this weekend. The presidential race is is big and gets a lot of attention, draws a lot of people in to vote. Um, but there are a lot of state offices uh, that are on the on the ballot in state voting. We're not voting this year for the biggest state offices: governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state. Those those come up every four years, and that'll be in in 2026. But talk about what people are going to see on the ballot, both statewide and then locally in this, in this uh, primary. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in California, really, the ballot is a big document <laughs> as opposed to some of the other states uh, I, I worked in. Um, so, yeah, obviously, you have the presidential. You also have the U.S. Senate, which is a really interesting race because it is the first time in 30 years that the seat has become open, right, vacated by uh, late Senator Dianne Feinstein. And so a lot of the Democrats and Republicans are running for that seat. Um, that race, uh, it's important to know that that will appear twice on your ballot. It is confusing because um, Governor Newsom has uh, cho chosen to consolidate the special election to finish Feinstein's term, which, um, which ends January 1st, 2025. And the election uh, and the general election to uh, to succeed Feinstein um, and be elected to a six year full term, and that term will end in January 2031. So it is very confusing, but that's why you will see the Senate on your ballot twice. Um, and then you sometimes feel like this is just designed to confuse people as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Our job is to explain it, and we're trying. But wow. Yeah. But yes. It, yeah. Yeah. You're 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 probably gonna be really confused. Why am I voting for the same person twice? But that's that's why. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And obviously, there's the U.S. Congress. You know, state senate. If you're 
uh, in an odd numbered district, um, that's when it is going to be, you know, that's when your uh, state senators are are up for re-election or, you know, if it's an open seat, um, then the state assembly, obviously, there is going to be a, uh, there's going to be one ballot measure on the primary ballot, which is Prop 1. Um, it is a controversial $6.4 billion dollar uh, bond measure that would overhaul the state's mental health system. Um, Newsom and the legislature are backing it, but, uh, you know, there are some critics who say that, you know, this proposal would be funding uh, Newsom's even more controversial care court um, an initiative, which includes, you know, involuntary uh, admission of, you know, the two mental health treatment programs. Um, so, so kind of looking ahead uh, in, in November, there are even, there, there's going to be even more ballot measures, but um, people are now only focused on the primary. So that's the only ballot measure that you will see uh, on there. And, um, I, I will say, don't forget, I, it, like, you know, people usually, usually we see the biggest turnout in terms of, you know, in a presidential year, right? Because people want to be voting for the top ticket. It is exciting. But there is also a lot of the local races that actually impact, you know, local residents, maybe even more than who's at the top of the ticket. Um, one example I will say is in Michigan, uh, you know, there was a local library that was, um you know, basically defunded multiple times during primary elections because, um, you know, local residents voted to uh, repeal the mileage that funds the local library. And so uh, that is really interesting because, you know, usually people don't, you know, go to the bottom of the uh, the ballot to, to fill out everything because it is so long, but that is also where you will see some of the most consequential races in your daily and the, life. And the ones that if they're local to you mean one vote means even more because if there's you know 40 million people in California, there might only be a couple hundred thousand people who can vote on the local issue that you're looking at, right? Yeah. Um, I did just drop in the chat a link. If you want to find out which district you live in in California and who your legislators are, there's a link there to it. Once we have our voter guide out, uh, that'll be in there as well. The voter guide is ready. Is it the end of this month? I think we'll have it out. Last couple of days of January, if I remember right. So yeah. we'll share February. that with everyone when it comes out. Uh, and thank you for sh scaring the heck out of our library crew here by mentioning a, <laughs> a ballot measure in another state that was going to shut down a library. Let's hope that's not happening in California. Uh, but they are very Im important and consequential and often very little publicized, right? If, uh, if you don't have a news organization that covers your community that's letting you know what's available or interest groups that are letting people know what, what they can vote on, in some places, folks don't know what's on the ballot. And that's one of the reasons that we see fewer people voting in, in, in some of these uh, primary elections. Uh, do feel free if you'd like to drop a question in the chat, happy to answer questions as we go. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit more about things that happen, things that can go wrong in voting, right? If you're, you get to the polls and you're, uh, you're not on a list, on the list of people who can vote, or you send in your ballot, but you made a mistake, or they're having trouble counting them. Share with us some of the things that sometimes uh, cause hitches in the process. Yeah, so like, um, so for people who arrive at the polls and discover, oh yeah, I'm not on the list. Um, I think the safest bet is, is just to contact your, you know, county elections officials. Hey, what's going on? Why am I not seeing it? And if it turns out that you're not registered, you can always, you know, complete the same day registration application, for example, and then have the ballot right there, right then. And then that's when you can, you can turn in your ballot and, um, so for mistakes that you made on a ballot, um, if you have turned in your ballot already and you realize, ah, like I, you know, missed some race or it, that I didn't vote on, or you know, I, I, I circled the wrong candidate, um, the safest bet is also to contact your county elect election officials and say, hey, you know, I made a mistake. Um, can I please have a, you know, uh, replacement ballot that I can fill out? Um, and if you if you haven't turned in your ballot, you can always you know, also request a new ballot and say, hey, I made a mistake, you know, explain to them why that's the case. Um, and, and, and usually, yes, that's, um, you know, uh, that's that that can get you through. Um, one thing I will say is, um, you know, some of the common mistakes that I've uh, heard people mention even before I came to California is uh, they will turn in their ballot kind of last minute, and, you know, we're all procrastinators. And so uh, some of them will drop off their 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 mail-in ballot on the day of, but after 
uh, you know, the last collection of the day. So if that's the case, then your ballot will be postmarked after the day after election day, which which should not be the case. You should always uh, remember to, you know, cast your ballot maybe, you know, as early as, as, as possible to avoid situations like that, the last minute rush. Um, and so, so yeah, I'll, 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 uh, I think those are some of the common mistakes that I've seen people make. Yeah, um, the, the, uh, the, the thing I think people miss sometimes, and certainly it, it doesn't become clear until you research this a little bit, it is the role of the government to encourage people to vote and to make it as easy as possible to vote. And so there are actually people in your county elections office who want you to vote, who want to be helpful, who want to solve a problem if there is a problem. Um, and they can't bend the rules. They can't count a ballot that, that, that goes in after the postmark date or right? after the mailbox has been emptied that day, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but there are people who want to help. There's an interesting question here uh, from Catherine. Are you aware of any public library programs or initiatives that have been successful in voter engagement? I don't think, Stella, that you and I are, but I wonder if some of the other folks on the call, Reed or anybody else uh, on the call from libraries who might have some thoughts about things that libraries have done to increase voter engagement. We'd, we'd love to have you uh, uh, let us know in the chat or, uh, or or jump in and join the conversation if you like. Um, I, I, I will say, oh, sorry to interrupt. No, I, I, I will say there was a pretty cool project when I was in Michigan um, that was done by a, a pair of professors um, affiliated with a university. And what they did was, uh, they were art professors. And so what they did was they asked their students to uh, kind of use cardboards to build out uh, in, in a gallery, really, like in a gallery and an exhibit that uh, guides people through the whole ballot filling process. So it, there will be a giant ballot at the at the entrance, and then people can walk in and walk through and kind of like wow. mimic that process to get them familiarized with you know, voting. I think that's a really cool idea that I saw. Uh, that that was that was last year. Um, so yeah, I wonder if our makes me wonder if our interactive team could recreate that online, right? <laughs> if you can you can kind of go through that on the screen. Um, the uh, uh, there, there are a couple of conversations here in the chat. The League of Women Voters in Marin County partners with the libraries to distribute voter registration information, which is great, and bookmarks. Uh, League of Women Voters is a huge force in getting information out about the about the elections to people. And, and I love that they go through libraries. Um, I know, um, and Reed is saying he, there was a robust citizenship program at the libraries in Azusa when, when he worked there. Um, the, the Cal Matters Voter Guide that's coming out in early February is gonna be available to, uh, it, it is sponsored by the state libraries and it's available to everybody, uh, all, all the libraries to use. We're gonna make it available to you in English and Spanish and in multiple formats. Um, one thing that worked well in 2018 uh, in the Alameda County Libraries uh, in Castro Valley, a community group and the library got together. They invited a bunch of people in from the community. They had a great turnout. They brought in pizza and they played the videos that Cal Matters had created about each ballot proposition. Here's proposition one and, and, and uh, here's proposition two, right? One at a time, talk about the ballot proposition and then have a community conversation about it where you invite people in the community to share what they're thinking, what they know about it, how they feel so that everybody gets to have a, a little bit of a, a you know, community conversation debate about it uh, in, in the room. And uh, we're gonna try to facilitate that again, not for the primary, but for the general election in November, uh, part of the package that we're doing in partnership with the California State Library will be the materials that you need uh, in a library or in a school or in a community group, uh, a, a church group, a work group, whatever, whatever groups people want to do, a, a bunch of friends gathered at the house to walk through a conversation where we talk about what's on the ballot, um, share a little bit of information about each item on the ballot, and have a conversation where people can inform each other about what they're thinking about it. And we're hoping that encourages uh, people to, you know, first to come to these events and then, of course, to, to vote. Uh, we did some in 2020 in various places around the state. And you, know, you would see people in the room with their ballot and the county voting guide taking notes as we talked through each thing. And in some cases, just you know, voting right there in, in, in person. So anything you can do to facilitate conversations among people about it, uh, even knowing there's an event and that your neighbors are going to talk about it, I think adds a little bit of uh, value, right? It makes it a little bit more important to everybody um, to, to, to know they need to pay attention. Um, speaking of paying attention with, uh, what, 80, 
state legislative seats and 20 seats in the state Senate and 52 congressional districts, plus all the local races. There's a lot going on this year. Uh, what are a couple of the ones that you as a politics writer are kind of particularly focused on paying attention to? Yeah, uh, I think, well, at the top of my list, uh, the U.S. Senate. Um, it's, it's it, like I said, it's really interesting that um, it's an open seat and uh, a lot of the high profile national, you know, figures are running, right? You have Adam Schiff, who has a big cash advantage. Um, you have Katie Porter, who uh, just launched her first TV ad buy focused on the Bay Area, where, where all the money is. And um, Barbara Lee, you know, is, is, is courting local Black and Latino voters who has a long history in Congress, long track record. Um, you have Steve Garvey, who jumped in the race kind of last minute, but you know, uh, he's largely, he's rising in the polls, um, if that's, you know, a, a worthy indicator. And um, he's, you know, largely running on name recognition right now. And, you know, you have Eric Early, who has won some of the local GOP endorsements. Um, you know, he has run, uh, but but lost in, in several elections prior to this one. And so, um, I mean, prior to, you know, this upcoming one. So, uh, so yeah, that's definitely one to pay attention to, I would say. And, you know, if you're in Central Valley where, you know, the, the voter turnout is not as high as, you know, some of the other areas, Kevin McCarthy's seat is definitely one to watch. Um, you know, he announced his uh, retirement from Congress, you know, really last minute as well. And that set off a mad scramble trying to succeed him, you know, legal fights. And and now you have Vince Fong, right, who has been endorsed by Kevin McCarthy really on the ballot for for two races at at one point. Um, one is his state assembly race because he's running unopposed, which means that he will probably win it. But at the same time, he's running for Congress. He's, um, you know, the the it regarded as one of the front runners um, because of that McCarthy endorsement. And he's probably, you know, he has a big, sh you know, a shot at winning that one as well. So that will be a very interesting race to watch, you know, whether he gives up one of these seats, whether that is going to draw uh, another special election that's going to cost a lot of taxpayer dollars. You know, and and for that race, I mean, there are several dates that people need to pay attention to. The March fifth is the the primary to elect someone to fulfill to succeed McCarthy and and uh, to a full term. But two weeks later, the same voters have to decide in a special election election primary that decides, you know, that elects someone to fulfill the remainder of McCarthy's term that ends January first, twenty twenty five. So that is going to be really confusing. Um, and I hope voters are following along, you know, trying to figure out, you know, trying to exercise their right, because it, it is going to be a lot of dates. Yeah. So. And at some point, if Vince Fong gets reelected to his assembly seat and also gets put into Congress, he's going to have to resign the assembly seat. There's one more special election to have. So exactly. even more voting, right, which uh, mm -hmm. uh, which which can be, I think, annoying to people. Um what, Stella, what last thoughts do you have as we get toward the end here? Uh, stuff you want people to know, stuff that folks who are educating voters ought to be making sure to share with them. Yeah, I think one of the things I really, and we already touched upon, is how important local races are, um, especially for, you know, um, uh, you know, counties that might have, you know, fewer resources, like rural counties in particular. Um, I think those races are really going to be um, the ones that 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 matter on a day to day basis. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, because of a lack of newspaper newspapers, you know, newspaper coverage in those areas, um, a lack of educational resources, people tend not to know, you know, who to vote, vote for why I need to vote in this race. So that's where you might see the the, the least level of engagement. But I also think that, you know, coming, coming from a previous, you know, a former local politics reporter, that's really, that yeah. really, really matters. And another thing I, I, I think, you know, people need to educate voters on continuously is, is, is how important, um, you know, election security is and, and uh, dismiss you know, or like dispel some of this um, some of this misinformation around, you know, uh, you know, election integrity or things like that. I, I think it's important to educate people what happens after you cast your ballot, um, how early county election officials can start count, you know, processing the ballots, um, why the results that first come out on election night aren't um, final, 
and, and why it takes so long for um, California election officials to count and certify, you know, and what happens at that, you know, uh, mandated public counting, uh, a public tally, a manual tally of those ballots that happen right after um, election day. So those are the things that I hope, you know, people can pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And on the first point about the local ballots, we, all of us will get a ballot in the mail pretty soon uh, or you know, within a month of the election. So we have a chance to look at it, understand what's on it, and then be able to guide other people through it. And that advice to, depending on the shape of your ballot, you know, go to the bottom or flip it over, look at the things on the back, or, or open the second, third, or fourth page. Uh, some, some ballots I've gotten have four or five pages in them, uh, encouraging people to go to the bottom. And this, this idea of disinformation, there's so much uh, information out there, much of it intended to dissuade people from voting about the integrity of the process. And we know from our reporting, there are very few instances of voter fraud. Uh, it's a tiny, tiny number to start with. And the ones that are caught are are fixed, but they're still such small numbers, they don't matter. And there's a lot of really hardworking local election officials out there trying to do this right, trying to make sure everybody gets their votes counted. So a little belief in the integrity of the process is, is, is helpful, especially in an, in an environment where there is a lot of disinformation. Um, Stella, thank you. Appreciate you taking the time to walk us through this. Um, thanks to everybody who joined and to our friends at the California State Library for making this possible. Uh, do check out the website. Uh, it's in the chat there, calmatters.org slash forward learning, where you'll find all the teaching and, and uh, information resources here. And uh, stay on that site and stay in touch with us because we will be sharing a lot more information, including the voter guide itself when it's out with everybody. And with that, thanks very much. We'll talk to everybody soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Okay.